So it's a real thrill to introduce Broder. Having had countless conversations with him about science, I find him to be one of the, the, the deeper and more rigorous thinkers in, in our field. And Broder's been interested in, in phase transitions throughout his training, dating back to his time as a PhD candidate with Dirk Gorlick. He had an excellent paper um, where he reconstituted via phase separation, the nuclear pore uh, in vitro and really elucidated rules about its selectivity and, and, and permeability. And that paper's been cited nearly 200 times. He then went on to Raj Rahaki's lab at Stanford where he currently is. And he continued working on, on phase transitions there, despite it not really being a, a phase separation lab. And there Broder had a series of papers uh, that were really elegant on TDP-43. The first was really prescient and it sort of ushered in and helped to usher in this current uh, interest in condensates with multi-layered topologies. And then the follow-up paper was really a careful dissection of the molecular grammar of TDP43 self-assembly and how that relates to function. I note that second paper in Nature Communications also involved this uh, ingenious splicing reporter assay that's now been used by other groups. Um, more recently, he has turned his attention uh, to cancer where he's studying the partitioning of chemotherapeutic agents in, into condensates. And this paper really highlights some of the things that, that, that make Broder unique. So Broder reads essentially every paper and, and his most recent work uh, on cancer really is a synthesis of everything that's happening in, in our field right now um, from thermodynamics to reentrant behavior uh, to the partitioning of, of small molecules into condensates with specificity. Um, and I think that really reflects sort of who Broder is as a scientist I, I finally want to add that um, Broder is also a leader. So he's one of the founders of the Intrinsically Disordered Special Interest Group at Stanford uh, and the Carnegie Institute. And, and that organization exploded uh, during COVID and provided an opportunity for scientists from diverse backgrounds and across the globe to present their work uh, in an environment that was otherwise, uh, you know, devoid of, of in-person meetings. And I owe Broder a debt of gratitude for, for that organization because I, I gave a talk there and, and, and that helped put me on Dewpoint's radar for which I'm obviously very grateful. Um, I wanna highlight that although Broder has uh, only been in the cancer game for a short period of time, he recently won a Frobeck scholarship um, for his, his work in, in that arena. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Broder. Well, thank you, B, for this very kind introduction, and thank you for DuPont for inviting me today to discuss approaches to target disorder proteins. But I want to actually start out our discussions by acknowledging one of the most powerful concepts in biochemistry, and that is the idea that structure is function. The idea that the three-dimensional folding of a protein is intimately linked um, to its function, for example, this kind of that I show here that uh, adds phosphate groups to proteins. In fact, we now know that cells rely so heavily on correctly folded proteins that they employ a sophisticated network of chaperones and spend vast amounts of energy to ensure the proper folding of proteins. However, it is now very clear that many proteins contain extended regions that do not fold into a stable tertiary structure, even in the presence of chaperones. And we call these unfolded protein domains that you can see here in this green shade and this alpha-2 prediction intrinsically disordered regions or short IDRs. And I want to emphasize that I'm not just cherry picking one example here. In fact, if you go to the DEPMAP database, you will find that uh, roughly 15% of all genes that encode for essential proteins uh, across hundreds of different cell lines uh, are more than 30% disordered. And this brings up the question of what is the function of this disorder domains? And work by many groups over the, the last 10 years or so um, have revealed a number of key functional categories, such as barrier formation by FG domains, interaction platforms, regulatory dimensions, the pole to C terminal domain, environmental sensing, or transcriptional activation. And as you can appreciate from this list of very fundamental and essential functions, um, the dysregulation and the dysfunction of disorder proteins is linked to diseases, in particular cancer and neurodegenerative diseases, as B alluded to in his introduction. So it's really becoming very clear that intrinsically disordered proteins are emerging as key regulators of cell state 
in health and disease. So what if, what if we could drug disorder proteins, right? Then we should be able to control cell state and to treat these devastating diseases. And what I want to talk to you about today is that it turns out that oxaloplatin, a cornerstone of cancer therapy since two decades, is exactly doing that. And specifically, what we found is that oxaloplatin uh, leverages the fact that many disorder proteins do not function in isolation, but rather function in a pack similar to, to wolves, right? And, and instead of being a social behavior, in the case of disorder proteins, this is a biophysical property that is encoded in the sequence and that manifests in the phase separation of this disorder proteins into biomolecular condensates. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I do want to point out that a few examples of where the phase separation of IDPs and uh, biomolecular condensates have been firmly linked to function. And one of the examples would be ribosome assembly, which occurs in the nucleoli, which are liquid-like condensates. Um, we mentioned the nuclear pore barrier. Um, and another example would be RNA transport granules, for example, which are RNA protein granules. So what is this oxaloplant and how does it work? And I want to point out right from the beginning that this is actually uh, a collaboration. Answering this question was a collaboration with Zain Jafar and On Brandman, also at Stanford Biochemistry. Um, oxaloplatin is a third generation organoplatinum compound that is comprised of a platinum warhead, an oxalate leaving group, and a diamonocyclohexane side chain. And much like earlier generations of uh, platinum compounds, in particular cisplatin or carboplatin, oxaloplatin is believed to target an alkali DNA, which causes crosslinks. And these crosslinks lead then to oxidative stress, replication stress, and DNA damage, which ultimately results in cell cycle arrest and cell death. However, a number of key findings in the recent past actually have uh, questioned that this is really the mechanism of action of oxaloplatin. In 2017, in a very beautiful functional genomics approach, um, it was shown that oxaloplatin actually has a, a, a genetic signature that is more reminiscent of ribosome biogenesis stress rather than DNA crosslinking. Earlier this year, Emily Sutton in the lab of uh, Victoria de Rose showed that oxaloplatin inhibits ribosomal RNA synthesis. And Zane and on, when uh, mapping RNA seq reads to primary transcripts either from Pol1, which originated in the nucleolus, or Pol2 as a control, noticed that oxaloplatin also interferes with RNA processing, right? As you can see here in this additional peak of map reads to this very end of the 45S RNA that is usually uh, cut out in the maturation of this ribosomal RNA. Then also this year, it was actually shown using nanosims, or if you want to, imaging mass spec, that oxaloplatin actually accumulates in nucleoli. So what are nucleoli? Nucleoli are multi-layered ribosome factories that form around ribosomal DNA in the nucleus. And um, it's firmly established that each of these different layers has its own function. Now here in the center, this is the fibrillar center, RNA transcription occurs. Surrounding this fibrillar center FC is the dense fibrillar component or DFC, where pre-RNAs are processed and then all of this is embedded in the granule component, or GC, where actually ribosomal subunits assemble. And as you can imagine from these different functions, um, these different layers also require a different set of proteins. And key proteins in the FC would be the RNA polymerase 1, uh, the scaffold, and, the, and a key RNA modification enzyme in, in the DFC is fibrillarin, and the probably best study scaffold of the GC is nucleophosphate. And uh, I highlight these proteins here because we can actually use them as markers to study these different phases. Um, as I alluded to earlier, on, beautiful work from uh, Cliff Brangwin and, and Antonio Hyman has really established that nucleola overall behave like liquids, right? And you can see this here in these beautiful DSC images um, where nucleolas that are coming to proximity fuse over time, just as you know, uh, the raindrops on your windshield will do. And then following this observation, uh, Marina Ferrick and Cliff Brangman's lab has established that actually these different sublayers are uh, have their own 
um, material properties that slightly vary. So the granular component is, is very viscous, a viscous liquid, whereas the DUC and possibly also the curvola centra have an elastic component. So they, they behave a little bit more jelly, if you want to. Then in a series of papers over the past years, um, spearheaded by the labs of Richard Kowaki and, and Cliff Bangrine, uh, it was really established that these different material properties in the places uh, and the, the different solubility of, of ribosomal components as they mature in these different layers are actually the basis of the vectorial assembly of ribosomal subunits. So given this link of oxaloplatin to nucleoli and the link of phase separation and, and, and multi-phase organization in the nucleoli to function, we wondered how this reactive molecule oxaloplatin would affect phase separation in the nucleoli. And to this end, we were very fortunate that um, Manuel Leonetti at the Chan Zuckerberg Institute shared with us a cell line where he endogenously labeled nucleophosmin and fibrillarum with fluorescent proteins. And we combined this with a fish staining against this 5 prime ETS. So this is this very um, uh, 5 prime terminal region in the 45S rRNA uh, as a marker of, of RNA. So then we can have a look at these different phases. When we treated the cells with cisplatin, uh, a molecule that has been established to cause DNA crosslinks, we didn't observe any effect on nucleoli. However, when we added oxaloplatin to the cells, we observed a number of striking effects. Well, first of all, you can see that the size of the nucleoli dramatically reduced. You can also appreciate that the nucleoli are much more spherical. And if you look closely at the different markers, all of a sudden you observe that this nucleola ultrastructure is, is altered and disrupted by, by oxaloplatin. And you can nicely see how nucleophosmin uh, uh, concentrates together and rounds up. You can see that fibrillarin has the most uh, strong signal here at those points where the nucleophosmin signal is the lowest. And then this rRNA seems to accumulate at the interface of these two uh, layers. And you can, can appreciate this very nicely here in this 3D reconstruction, where you again have the rRNA sandwiched between this fibrillarin cap and the nuclear plasma. And this was really indicative to us of major changes in the phase properties of the nucleolus, um, especially this rounding up effect suggests that there were also massive changes in the biophysical properties, such as the surface tension. And indeed, when we estimated this, we found that um, the changes in surface tension are at least one order of magnitude compared to the untreated or the cisplatin treated case. But what is interesting is that we not only observed that oxaloplatin caused the disintegration of the uh, nucleolus ultrastructure at large, when we actually looked at multiple markers here in the granular component, um, in particular nucleophosmin and SERF6, which have been previously shown to actually interact and, and form the scaffold of the granular component. And this was work from Diana Micheri and Richard Kuraki's lab when she was there. Um, we, we noticed that oxaloplatin, oxaloplatin actually, and I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead, um, also demixes this, these two, this, this granular component. Uh, right? And you can nicely see this here. Nucleophosmin again becomes more spherical, and you see that the surf six signal actually localizes to the outer surface of the, the outer rim of this nucleophosmin phase. And inspired by the work from Diana and, and, and Richard, um, what this really suggested to us is that there was a, a, a switch from these heterotypic nucleophosmin and surf six interaction to more homotypic interactions. And to follow this up, we decided. Maybe we can use oxaloplatin to carefully map phase diagrams of this behavior, right? And this was really inspired by the idea that if we just take a standard two-dimensional phase diagram, right, what we typically plot is an interaction parameter that we typically express as a function of temperature or salt concentration against protein concentration, right? So basically when we start out here, this one-phase regime of the phase diagram increase the concentration to go to this point two, we would have phase separation, oops, and uh, if we then, for example, would change the temperature, or increase the temperature, we could dissolve these phases, right? So we were wondering, well, perhaps oxaloplatin could be, uh, you know, a modulator of this interaction parameters. And so we decided to plot this against the concentrations of nucleophosmin. And these concentrations we can easily measure from our microscopy images. 
right? The concentration uh, is essentially proportional to the fluorescence identity, intensity. So we quantified the signal here in the nucleoplasm. This would be then the, the light phase. And we quantified the signal in the nucleola in our dense phase, and we plotted it in here in our plot. Now, obviously, the concentration of oxaloplatin we know because we added to the cells. And what's interesting, when we titrated in increasing amounts of oxaloplatin, we first of all observed that the light phase concentration didn't change much. Or in other words, the critical concentration for phase separation didn't change much. But what we noticed is that the dense phase concentration changed quite a bit. Right? So if we could play this here to the untreated case, you see that there's an increased driving force for nuclear phosphate and phase separation. Surprisingly, we use exactly the opposite for SURF-6, um, where if you compare this to the untreated case, we observe that there's a decreased driving force of phase separation, right? So the dense phase, phase concentration is clearly reduced. And now increased and decreased driving forces, right? This is a qualitative term, but it turns out we can actually quantify this. And I wanna point out that this is inspired by the beautiful work um, from Josh Weaver when he was a postdoc in Cliff Brangwine's lab. And he essentially shown that the free energy, the free transfer energy of, let's say, nuclear phosphate from the light phase into the nuclear light is a function of the partitioning coefficient or the ratio of the dense to light phase concentration, which means there's nothing else than essentially the width of the, the binodal here in our phase diagram. And this now allows us to essentially quantify this change in driving force compared to the untreated case, right? So this is essentially uh, a delta delta G that we calculate here. And as you can see in the case of nuclear phosphon, right? If the delta G for in the untreated case is smaller than the delta G in the treated case, the delta delta G will be negative. So there will be a greater driving force. And what this analysis now allows us is to build a superphase diagram where we now can compare in one plot the behavior of two different proteins, in this case, nuclear phosmin and SERF6. And before I show you the data, I kind of want to walk you through this somewhat more complex plot, okay? We have essentially three quadrants in this plot, only two of which really matter for our analysis. This first quadrant here, both the delta delta G for nuclear phosmin and SERF6 will be positive, meaning that uh, both their phase separation would be energetically more unfavorable. Here in this second quadrant, we have a negative delta delta G for nuclear phosphine, but a positive delta delta G for SERF6, meaning that the phase separation of, of, of nuclear phosphine in this regime would be energetically more favorable, whereas the phase separation of SERF6 would be energetically less favorable. And what I'm about to plot here is various drugs at various concentrations, and the concentrations will be color coded. And I'm not only showing you cisplatin and oxaloplatin, the two clinically used anti-cancer drugs we've already compared before. I'm also adding a, a third drug here, which is actinomycin D, which is a selective RNA polymerase inhibitor, which is actually not clinically used because it is so toxic that there's no therapeutic work. So when you add clinical concentrations of cisplatin, uh, nothing happens to the nucleoli, as we have seen in the, in the images. But as we kind of increase the concentration of cisplatin, we start to observe this demixing effect. Uh, and if we have very high concentrations of cisplatin, you know, the, the extent of this demixing is actually very similar to what we observe with clinical and low concentrations of oxaloplatin. But as you can see here, what is interesting, as we titrate in more oxaloplatin, we actually have this inflection point and the delta delta G for nuclear phosphate transfer from the light phase to the dense phase becomes less negative. And if we add actinomycin D, we can actually push this entire system into this regime where both the delta delta G for nuclear phosphate and SERP6 are positive, indicative of the complete dissolution of nuclear light. And what is really cool about it is now we essentially have a map where we can compare drug concentrations to effects on nucleoli we have an idea in what regime we would expect have, to have a therapeutic window that is similar to our cell plan. And what was also very cool to see is when Zane actually treated purified fibrillarin and nuclear phosphine with oxaloplatin and cisplatin, he observed the same type of dose dependence. 
right? You can see that oxaloplatin readily modifies fibrillarin as visualized here on this uh, protein gel. And so this is a red output then a staining against, antibody staining against fibrillarin on the plasma. You can see here this shift on the gel, right? Indicative of the crosslinks. You can see oxaloplatin readily does this at clinical concentration and this amount of this modification increases with increasing concentration of oxaloplatin, whereas cisplatin is much uh, weaker in this effect. And uh, from his analysis, it also appears that fibrillarin is more heavily modified compared to nucleoplasm. But what's really cool to see is that this really suggested to us that oxaloplatin may not only modify nucleic acids, rRNAs in this case, but also proteins, in particular disordered proteins like fibrillarin. Well, but what about actinomycin D? Now, unlike oxaloplatin, actinomycin D is not a reactive molecule, but as you recall from this plot, it has a very strong effect on nucleoli. So what we found very helpful to discern the difference between these two drugs was actually not only a titration series, but also a temporal analysis of the effect. And particularly what we did, we looked at nucleolar function and we used as a proxy this five prime ETS signal, so the rRNA signal in our fish, and we looked at demixing simply by measuring changes in the eccentricity of nucleic plasmids, so essentially asking, um, you know, for me to go from like an elongated shape to a more rounded shape. And what, you, what we observed is when we treated the cells with actinomycin D, there was an immediate effect on nucleolar function, on RNA transcription and, and processing. However, the effect on morphology, the demixing effect by actinomycin D was actually delayed by at least half an hour. In the case of oxaloplatin, we observed that the function and the demixing effect actually happened uh, around the same time. So what we think is going on here is that oxaloplatin first causes the nucleolar demixing, which then leads to the uh, dysfunction of nucleoli, whereas actinomycin D first inhibits the function and then the lack of RNAs will cause the nucleo demixing. So the model that we propose is that actinomycin D passively diffuses into nucleoli, where it then specifically inhibits polymerase one, which immediately kills cells. So in a way you can think of actinomycin D as a kill switch, right? If you add it, boom, RNA transcription stops, cells die, and because this is so effective, there's essentially no therapeutic window because cancer cells and non-cancer cells will just die right away. Now, in the case of oxaloplatin, uh, we believe that the drug enriches in nucleoli due to matching physical chemical properties, right? And this is in line with the observation from, from the nanosims that um, oxaloplatin does enrich in nucleoli. And it's also very much in line with the beautiful work from, from Isaac Klein and, and, and Rick Young that showed that this is also the case for a number of other uh, um, chemotherapy drugs. And this enrichment then allows oxaloplatin to chemically modify nucleolar scaffold components, especially fibrillarin and RNA, which then causes the nucleolar demixing cell cycle arrest and a more importantly, a more gradual decline in ribosome assembly. So oxaloplatin acts more like a dimmer that causes a slow cell death. And I think we'll be very interesting in, in future work to see whether oxaloplatin exploits the increased needs of cancer cells for ribosomes to sustain rapid growth, uh, or and perhaps also and whether it exploits um, difference in, in nucleolar morphology and nucleolar biophysical properties that are already present in cancer cells and it just exacerbates that effect. So what this really suggests is that there might be a new paradigm for drug development. So what I mean by this is, if we look at the conventional approach to develop drugs, right, then there's a strong focus on targeting specific molecules with high affinity binders, right? And this is known as the, the lock and key model. And what our work and, and the work of, of Isaac and others suggests is that there is now another way to, to, to develop drugs, and this is by targeting the biophysics of condensates, right? And I call this the seek and disrupt the pack model. Uh, and because you're not directly targeting the function, but the biophysics, uh, the idea is that you can expand the therapeutic window of many drugs, and you actually can drug essential cellular functions, such as transcription and translation. 
But in the last few minutes of my talk, um, I actually want to take uh, on a somewhat more critical stance of this model and, and ask the question of how broadly applicable this. Because we actually know that many disease-linked IDPs stray from the pack, so to say, right? So the question really is, can you draw the biophysics of lone wolf IDPs, as I kind of call this a little bit eccentrically in my title? And the short answer is that it turns out it's still very tricky. But what do I mean by all of this? And to explain this to you, I want to give you an example. And this example is the RNA binding protein TDB43, which, which is a very relevant example. And TDB43 um, is predominantly lupinized in the nucleus and is actively transported into the nucleus. And there's also been some reports of some passive uh, diffusion out of the nucleus. So there's some low level of shuttling. And TDB43 is tightly linked to a number of neurogenerative diseases, and particularly amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, frontotemporal dementia, and the, the dementia uh, late. And really the clinical hallmark of these diseases is that TDB43 forms these cytoplasmic aggregates in this disease. Now in its physiological form, TDB43 has been shown to uh, associate with a number of different condenses including paraspeckles, TDB43 foci, nuclear stress bodies in the, nucle in the nucleus, and RNA transmit granules and stress granules in the cytoplasm, right? And I think what is important to highlight here is that in none of these cases, there's really very firm evidence suggesting that TDB43 is a scaffold of any of these condensates to, to a similar degree as, for example, triple iron is for the GFC. And this brings up a number of, of, of key questions that actually be very nicely highlighted in his recent review. And that is, in what phase does TDB43 function? And does it have different functions in different phases? How does this vary between cell types? And then more from a drug um, development perspective, is TDB43 phase separation obligatory? Meaning if we would target, let's say one condensate, can we live with the consequences this may have on another TDB43 containing condensate? And I think these are big questions that uh, will take a few years to fully unravel. And I think one of the major barriers to finding good answers to these questions is the need of new quantitative tools to study the function of disorder proteins. And as we said, we've actually spent quite some time on developing such tools for TDB43. And I just want to give you a, a quick taste of it as, as time is uh, limited. And so TD43, the, one of the best understood functions of this RNA binding protein is um, the skipping of cryptic exons, right? So TD43 binds to define sites and RNAs. And this binding uh, will then signal to the cell, to the splicing machinery, that the exon here has to be skipped. And we thought, you know, we can use this function, and if we just take such a TDB42 dependent exon and put it into a fusion between a GFP and an M-cherry, we could essentially build a fluorescent recorder for this splicing event, right? So the idea is that in the presence of functional TDB43, this exon gets skipped, and we would get both a GFP and an M-cherry signal. However, if we have non-functional TDB43, we would only get a GFP signal. And this now allows us to, to read out the splicing event in a quantitative and facile manner uh, on a single cell level using flow cytometry. And you can see this here. We transfected this reporter into wild type cells and transfected it into TD4 to the knockout cells. And you can see here this difference in, uh, in the flow cytometry. And what this tool now allows is high throughput studies uh, to study the effect of sequence, secondary structure, phase separation, or even genetic interactions on the function of TDB43. And yeah, uh, again, I, I will not go into much more detail about this. If you have questions about this, please reach out or refer to our papers. So with this, I actually want to thank you for joining my talk. And I want to thank you, I want to thank both the Brandman and the Rahatki Labs for providing an exciting environment to do these studies, and particularly on Zain and, and Raj, um, who have been really a fun team to work with um, on the Oxalo Plant project. We had help from Scott Dixon and Jason Rodenkoll at, at Stanford with some of the uh, cell viability essays that, that I didn't go into. As I mentioned, Manu Leno Netti from the Jan Zuckerberg Initiative uh, contributed to cell lines. 
I also want to acknowledge Ariana Barro and Kali Weber Levine, two very talented undergrads that, that worked with me on the TD for the Function and Face Separation Project. I want to thank the funding agencies. And I do want to also thank IDP Sick and friends for really carrying me through this pandemic. And with this, uh, I'm happy to take your questions and I hope that we have a, a lively discussion. That was really marvelous, Broder. And, and I think the, the transfer free energy um, work is really a, a, an incredible advance because it you know, parameterizes what a therapeutic index looks like in, in, in sort of a, with a biophysical grounding. And, and I think that's pretty neat. So it really motivated me to think about your um, cell reports paper where you have these <laughs> vacuolated TDP43 condensates. And those are large and readily visualizable. And at, you know, as you articulated, that's like a key drug target in, in the context of neurodegenerative disease. So have you thought about you know, combining the, the advances from your recent work with, with that reporter and looking for modulators of, of the phase behavior of TDP43 using your vacuolated reporter? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, the short answer is, Yes, I have thought about it, um, but I, I don't have any data. I haven't done it yet, right? And um, yes, yeah, so these this this other report system that we are mentioning that, that essentially is um, just to get everybody up to speed. This is essentially uh, a trick to essentially overemphasize the contributions of the disordered domain to TD forty three phase separation. And the advantage of it really is that you form gigantic droplets. In the nucleus, in the nucleus, sorry, that are easily screenable, right? So I think yes, there's a lot of potential in using such an image-based approach to do essentially a similar uh, study as we did, for example, applying in the nucleolus for TDB43. But what I wanted to highlight is right, it's it's a bit more tricky if you go after things like TDB43 because there is essentially much more unknown about the function of the protein per se, which is uh, why I think functional reporters are invaluable also in this approach. Thanks, thanks, Broder. Alex Holhouse has a question. Hello, Broder, beautiful talk. Uh, I'm out in the corridor. My lab is watching it on our big screen, and so I escaped to try and avoid the echo, but let me know if you get feedback and I can move further away. Um, so this is really beautiful. Um, one thing I was wondering, with the, um, the, the oxyplatin inhibition, Oxaloplatin will inhibit polymerase, right? But do you have a sense of the specificity from pole one versus pole two versus pole three? Because you could sort of imagine that there may be an effect of inhibiting pole two, for example, either in the release of lots of now partially synthesized mRNA transcripts or the inhibition of using nucleotides in the nucleus. And I'm wondering if you thought of all about that and what that right. contribution might look like. So I, I do want to point out, uh, just for clarification, so Actinomycin D is the drug. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Actinomycin D. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, targets polymerase, and it is. And yes, thank you for pointing out. Actually, uh, you know, it can inhibit multiple polymerases, right? RNA pole one, RNA pole two, and essentially this is concentration dependent. Um, but so at lower concentrations, you get somewhat of specificity for for RNA pole one. Um, I do think that you know the. The extreme toxicity of this, this this drug is related to the fact, right, that essentially you can shut off not only RNA transcription, you can shut off all transcription with it. Um, so, I think the then the I would kind of turn around your question, right, and I would see say that the really the need effect of oxaloplatin is that because it you know targets the nucleolus, it actually does allow you to um, inhibit only the function of nucleoli, in this case, you know, pole one related transcripts, right? So I think this is part of the reason why oxaloplatin actually does have a therapeutic window in contrast to actinomycin D. Um, I, ho I hope that kind of trick of mind answers your question. Yeah, I mean, I guess one thing I was thinking is I think alpha amanitin is specific for one and three, but not two. And that might be an alternative to sort of decouple the impact of broad uh, MRI transcription. But yeah, beautiful, it's, it's great. Yeah, so so I think um, in that respect, um, if you if you go to to, to Josh Reebok's paper, right, 
um, you know, the, he has essentially shown, and there's actually much not only Joss's work, actually does, you know, also if you look at, at Richard's papers, right? So the RNA um, plays a critical role for phase separation, like, to, like it does in other systems, right? In, 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 in RNA granules. So taking away the R RNA, right, will also alter the nucleolar properties and the nucleolar phase separation properties, right? So, so that's why I think you know there is the secondary effect of you know if you inhibit this the, the polymerase, then you will have a consequence on uh, on the nucleolar function. And, and, and what I didn't show, and I maybe you should have put this in, right? Is you know if you look at <clears throat> viability of cells in response to different drugs, you can also see that actinomycin D has a very strong effect early on, where cisplatin and, and the particular oxal plant have a much more delayed effect. So there's a, a very provocative question from Nick Fauzi in the chat. Mm -hmm. Nick? Sorry, I'm here. Um, I was wondering, Broder, excellent talk. I was wondering yeah. if, uh, if IDP modifying drugs are going to be covalent modifiers. I, I think you showed that the proteins were covalently modified in the, in the gel. <laughs> that was kind of the first question. And then I was wondering, are, are uh, ribosomal RNAs in this case modified as well? Like what is the, the mechanism of action? And may, maybe you said it, maybe I just missed it. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think this is a provocative question at all. Um, it's actually a great question. So I do think I, I do have a very special interest, I guess, in, in drugs that do covalently modify um, proteins and, and also RNAs um, in the context of drug incontinences, because I think really, in a way, sometimes I like to think about oxaloplatin and those platinum modifications as kind of aberrant or drug-induced post-translation modifications that essentially alter the valency of the IDRs and the RNAs. And then to your, your second question, actually, whether RNAs are modified, I think actually we do have some, um, some uh, data on this. And essentially what this mapping of the reads to the different transcripts uh, does, you can actually use this also to map with a nucleotide resolution where you have um, a platinum crosslink, right? Because this kind of protocol actually involves a circularization of the RNA. So you can sequence right up to where you have this crosslink. So that we, the fact that we see this peak here is actually indicative of the, of the fact that oxaloplatin does modify this RNA. And, um, you know, there are also other ev evidence for this in, in, in the literature. So the, there's a, a great question in the chat from Saskia Hutton. Apologies if I got that name incorrect. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> Flexible. Uh, hi, Frode. I hi. was wondering, because um, you can purify nucleoli from cells to, to high purity and they stay intact. You can put them on the EM grid. You can uh, look at them under the microscope. Have you tried to add uh, oxaliplatin to those and see whether they also change the structure or what happens actually to those? those? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we thought about it. We've gotten the EM grids and uh, we haven't gotten around to doing this. I think, um, you know, but even with this, you know, the, the three colored cell line that would maybe be by fluorescence possibly already. Uh, you mean just purifying the nucleolar from that cell lines? Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. I think that should be for us much more readily be doable than than, than the end. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, with the advent of cryoM, I was obviously kind of fascinated to, you know, wondering how that would look like. Um, so hopefully something we get around to doing. Um, yeah, so we, we do have, so far in the individual work, kind of only the, the direct readout of modification of individual components in, in different, both in a soluble form as well as in a phase separated form. Thanks. So there's a talk in, there's a question in the chat that 
is, is pretty interesting. So do you think that, and this is something I've, I've, I've thought about, and I'm very much interested in your <laughs> comments. Do you think it's going to be possible to dissolve aggregates with IDR targeting drugs, or do you think the best shot is preventing further aggregation? Yeah. Well, I think, I think that the kind of disaggregation approach, I think I'm most excited about, you know, essentially the approaches that the, the Shorto Lab pioneered, right, to essentially try to disintegrate the aggregates and refold or, or, or solubilize the proteins again. And, you know, I think what would be kind of cool, like using some of the functional readouts, like maybe the spicing reporter, to see whether you can actually restore function this way. Um, I'm somewhat hesitant, I think, uh, with with modifying drugs like oxaloplatin, um, because you, you will have then maybe a more soluble disorder protein again, but it will be modified. So it would be important to see how this affects uh, the function. But for that, really, I think, yeah, I, I would say I'm, I'm kind of more excited about trying using the capabilities of the cells to to do that in some way or the other. Um, from and you know, I, I guess you guys would be the ones that have more knowledge in this. But from a from a drug development approach, it might be easier to to go after prevention of aggregation if if that is at all possible. Right? Um, I think it's a challenge to to design drugs that target aggregates but don't target condensates. That was a beautiful talk, Broder. This is Deanna. Um, so I was uh, curious. So it was fascinating to see that oxaloplatin was driving the opposite directions, the um, driving for phase separation for NPM1 and CERF6. So that sort of suggested to me that there's very strong RNA component, RNA effect component. That, uh, make all sense me. So I was wondering, have you looked at the um, ribosomal proteins and see what happens to them um, when you when you treat with oxaloplatin and have you looked at the reversibility effect like once you wash off the compound what do, do the nucleoli go back and what's the time mm -hmm, scale mm -hmm. for that? Um, I like your second question that's a great, great idea we haven't done that um, in response to your first question um, we know from essentially ribosome footprinting experiments that the ribosomal proteins, um, the translation of them gets, gets, gets upregulated. We also know that from, from just conventional RNA-seq that a lot of the small nuclear RNAs, right? So not the rRNA that's eventually ending up in the ribosome, that those also get upregulated. So um, I think in factoring in this additional complexity, and, and how these molecules that also supposedly go to the nucleus and supposedly also contribute in the scaffolding and, the, and the, contribute to the chemical environment, contribute to the material properties. I think that will be interesting to see how those factor in. And yeah. So there's definitely more, more to come. Yep. Wonderful, Broder. Thank you very much for your time and uh, engaging uh, discussion afterwards. Really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. That was fun. With that, we'll close it down. And uh, thanks everybody for coming. Join us in October, three weeks away. Thanks again, Broder. Awesome talk. Thank you.